Yo, 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 what's going on, everybody? It's your servant in the Lord, Jorge Ortiz, and this is the We Will Build for This podcast. We exist to help the church know what they believe, why they believe what they believe, and ultimately help them defend what they believe. I want to start this podcast with a quote by Abraham Kuyper that says this, no single piece of our mental world is to be hermeneutically sealed off from the rest. And there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Hope you guys are doing blessed. I hope this video is finding you and your family uh, extremely well. I want to apologize. It's been a few weeks since we dropped the episode. Um, ultimately the kids started school. We've been really busy with that. Um, just getting them situated. I got one more that I'm sending off, uh, to start her sophomore year in college. Uh, so y'all please, uh, please, uh, pray for me as we, uh, venture on doing that. Um, this is part two of our podcast episode called discerning the times. Our first episode, we had my brother, Austin Ryan Griffin from theology matters. Uh, helping us out. And we just ultimately discussed uh, the importance of being able to discern the times, to be able to distinguish what is going on in the world today. We spoke about politics. We spoke about the election. We spoke um, a little bit about sphere sovereignty. Um, and ultimately, we just discussed how important it is for Christians to not wave the Jesus 2024 flag um, as an excuse or a justification to not be involved in the civil sphere or the local sphere the, of their sphere of the government um, and ultimately handing off um, the world, uh, again, the civil sphere, the local sphere, the government sphere to pagans. Here's the deal, guys. My goal in this discussion is not ultimately to get you to get out to the polls and vote. Right. Uh, whether you're voting for candidate A or candidate B, whether you're voting for the left or you're voting for the right. That's not the goal of this discussion. The goal of this discussion is that, you know, what's going on in that sphere, right? That, you know, what's going on in the civil sphere, because ultimately, based off the discussion that we had uh, in our last episode and based off of what we're going to talk about today, you will see that that sphere of the government, that realm of authority only exists because God allows it to. And we are called to submit under that sphere, under that authority, as long as it continues to reign morally and under the law of God. So if you don't know what's going on in politics, if you don't know what's going on in the White House, if you don't know what's going on um, in your local uh, state, neighborhood, in your cities, then ultimately, what are you going to leave your kids in the future, right? Uh, the word of God says in Proverbs that a wise man leaves an inheritance to his children. Ultimately, my goal is to leave an inheritance to my children, right? Um, I, I would, as, as much as I would wrestle with my eschatology, I would land on the side of a post mill, right? where I don't necessarily believe that things are going to get extremely better and we're going to Christianize the world. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that that's what the post mill view uh, tends to, to address. But I do believe that, that God is in control. I do believe that throughout time and throughout history, we have handed over the spheres of government um, to pagans. And I do believe that we need to regain control. I do believe that we need to be involved. And I do believe that more people are going to get saved. I do believe that Christianity, it's going to explode as things get worse. Naturally, I believe things will get better spiritually, right? So ultimately, whether, you know, the Lord comes back tomorrow or a hundred years from now, I have a responsibility as a father and as a human being to leave an inheritance for my children. And I want them to know what's going on in the world. Now, if they personally choose not to vote for candidate A or candidate B uh, based off of their biblical beliefs, then I agree. And we're going to get a little bit into that discussion today because I have seen so many brothers and sisters in the faith get into huge arguments about who they're going to vote for, why they're not going to vote for um, Donald Trump, and, and why Christians, right? are choosing to vote for 
Kamala Harris, right? It is important that we understand why. And, and here's the deal. If you're going to choose not to vote, then you also have to understand that you're handing over the elections to pagans, right? Now, some people may say, look, Brother George, your vote doesn't matter, right? Uh, they're going to find a way to scheme and scam and whatever the case may be. But here's the deal. Based off of what we were taught, based off of what we believe, the elections are a way to put that authority back into the hands that we may vote in the best candidate to represent our country. Right now, if you're going to choose not to do so, then that's fine. But let me tell you something. You better be very involved in your local elections and your state elections, because ultimately, here's the deal. Christians tend to have so much to say when pagans are ruling the world. But when it's time to do something about it, they want to opt out. They want to wave the Jesus 2024 flag and they don't want to cast a vote. They don't want to put in their ballot because ultimately this uh, a person uh, doesn't ultimately represent 100% where I stand biblically. And, and for sure, this other person is nowhere cl close to what I believe or what I represent biblically. Therefore, I'm just not going to vote, right? I don't personally don't think that's the solution. Now, here's the deal. I know, according to Romans 14, um, that there's liberties in Christ. Therefore, I will back you up on whatever decision you make. But as a Christian, your job is to make your voice heard. And, and, and the only way to, to make your voice heard is not just through the presidential elections. Okay, so let's get that straight. Um, but ultimately, the reality is this, guys. Whether you choose to vote or not, whether you vote right and you vote for Donald Trump, um, which I would I would hope that if and when you're going to, that's what you're going to do. And obviously, my biases are, are shown, and, and I'll get to that. Um, I hope that's what you're going to do. Or if you're going to vote left, and I don't see why you would vote left at any point in time, why any Christian would ever vote left, um, unless you're 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 you've been indoctrinated by Marxist agendas, uh, woke ideologies. That's the only reason why I would see any Christian voting left. Or whether you choose not to vote, my goal is to help you understand the sovereignty of God. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you're watching this video, guys, please like this video. Leave us a comment. Share it with somebody. Look, let me tell you something, guys. I've been seeing Bryson, um, I think it's Bryson Gray, uh, talk about this a lot. If y'all see this video and y'all know, man, send it to him. I would love to have him on the podcast. I would love to talk to him about about this because he's been he's been making a lot of a noise um and i don't mean noise in a bad way i mean he's been he's been rocking the internet uh with his views uh regarding this and he's lost uh, i think the other day he said that he lost over eight thousand followers on instagram when he decided to say that he wasn't gonna vote for trump um but at the end of the day he also made it clear that he wasn't gonna vote for kamala so praise god for that but i would definitely like to have a discussion with him today we're going to talk about sphere sovereignty and the lesser magistrate. Now, here's the deal. These are issues that I am becoming more and more familiar with, okay? Now, I do believe that if you are a um, well-taught Christian, right, if you study your Bible, if you study church history, then to some degree, you're, you're going to know some of this stuff. You may not know the terminology. You may not know exactly the words that are being used or where it comes from. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, and I'll admit that, that I'm in the same boat with you. Um, but ultimately, these are biblical things that we have heard at some point in time. Um, and, and, and what I'm hoping to do is just kind of put some 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 thoughts and some philosophies uh, uh, next to some faces so you know what we're talking about. So let's start with sphere sovereignty. OK, sphere sovereignty. And we talked about this a little bit last week, but I think it's important um, that that we ultimately uh really get into it and define it um in order for us to understand what it means okay so sphere sovereignty in neo-calvinism sphere sovereignty also known as differentiated responsibility is the concept that each sphere of life has its own distinct responsibilities and authority or competence and stands equal to other spheres of life. That's from Wikipedia, right? I got another example that I want to share with you guys, but I want to share this on the screen real quick, um, just so you can see 
what I'm talking about here. And I shared this last uh, last last podcast with you guys. Sphere sovereignty, right? The biblical principle in sphere sovereignty is that we ought to obey God rather than man. Therefore, no human institution has the right to lay a total claim on human life. Human institutions are authorized to lay their claim upon us and exercise authority over us only within their own sphere. That is sphere sovereignty, right? So as you can see here, right, and I I want you to kind of look at this diagram. And if you're listening on Spotify or on our podcast platforms, um, you can easily look this up just by putting sphere sovereignty diagram. Um, you can see what we mean by sphere. Obviously, this is a philosophy. This is something uh, to help us categorize what we mean. Um, but when we're talking about spheres, we're talking about a big circle, right? The big circle of life in which Christ rules. Within that sphere, we have different spheres like the, the church, the state, the family, the market, the academy, the society, charity. Right. You have these different spheres that ultimately hold up, you know, our our world system. Right. And when we're talking about sphere sovereignty, we're talking about how every sphere is sovereign within their own jurisdiction. Now, what does that mean? Is that the state is able to exercise its authority within its jurisdiction within the realm that God has placed them in according to his law in order to exercise justice, in order to exercise judgment, in order to, you know, tell you what's right, what's wrong, and and, and punish you if you happen to do something that is wrong. Um, Ultimately, that there is a justice system that if and when you are accused of doing something wrong and, and, and it's not true that the system is designed according to God's moral standard to prove your inner innocence and, and it works within its own realm, right? The state, uh, the church, the church within its own sphere has the authority to exercise, right? Judgment in the ecclesiastical government according to the authority given to them by God. Right. And here's the deal. Uh, To a degree, I believe that it's okay to to have a separation of state and church, because if you don't, then evil men can corrupt the state and try to take over the church. But also evil men can corrupt the church and try to take over the state. And we've seen that in the Middle Ages with Rome. Right. Um, But ultimately, though, they may intermingle a little bit or they may cross each other. Um, there to exercise their authority within their own spheres. Same thing with the family, right? The family is a sphere within itself. My family here, right? I'm the father. I got a wife and I have four kids. My job is to exercise authority within my family, okay? According to God's standard and the Bible standard for a man in my life. If and when I begin to do something illegal, right? Then The sphere of the state may get involved. Uh, Charges may get pressed if I do something crazy, right? And and, and the the state in its jurisdiction has the right to intervene in the family sphere um, and, 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 you know, put me in jail for doing something wrong. Or say the church, say me and my wife are having issues and things go wrong. The church within its sphere, has the right to step in um, maybe as a mediator between my wife and myself and and have counseling or whatever the case may be. But ultimately, each of these spheres have sovereignty within their own jurisdiction. And some of them may, you know, kind of cross each other's boundaries. Some of them may exist within other spheres. But ultimately, Christ is sovereign. Overall, now if you look at this uh, uh, diagram here, these are two examples. Um, and if you read the, the the diagram, it says we are all under an ultimate authority. The question is, which one, Christ or the state? One of the diagrams you see that Christ is the ultimate sphere, as it should be, and in the second diagram you see that the state is the ultimate 
diagram. And that's what we want to talk about, right? We want to talk about sphere sovereignty. We want to give you an idea of what it is. Um, now, just so you know, this is a 19th century philosophy, um, but it is a biblical philosophy, right? It was ultimately coined by Abraham Kuyper, but it is known that it, it began kind of flourishing within the 16th century. Um, but I do want to help you understand exactly uh, what it is, right? So let, let's jump into it. Um, we are all under an ultimate authority. The question is, which one? Christ or the state? The Dutch philosopher, theologian, and prime minister, Abraham Kuyper, developed a system of thought to assist in understanding the authority structure in the world. The system is called sphere sovereignty, and it helps answer the question, who do we obey when various demands on us and our behavior clash, right? This is who coined the phrase fear sovereignty and ultimately developed this philosophy that we have today. Now, here's the deal. Depending on who you listen to, um, you may hear people say that they're Kyperian, right? <laughs> and what they mean by that is that they follow Abraham Kuyper's teachings, right? Now, I I'll be the first one to tell you, man, like, I used to have this issue when I first, you know, realized what the difference was between Arminianism and Calvinism. And I used to, you know, throw out this quote and say, oh, you know, I don't I don't go to the labels. I'm, I'm just a Bible believer. And then eventually, as a Bible believer, I started clashing with other pro so-called Bible believers that I had to plant the flag of Calvinism. Right. And said, you know what? Um I am a Calvinist in regards to soteriology. I believe the doctrines of grace. Um, and that's where I stand, right? Uh, now I would say I'm, I'm, I'm biblically reformed, right? Um, but what I'm trying to say is that you may hear a bunch of people saying, oh, I'm Calvinist, but I'm also a Kyperianist and things of that nature. Here's the deal. I just want to be able to put these terms to a face and help you understand what they mean by Kyperianism is Abraham Kuyper, Right. This was a man who was born um, October 29th in 1837 in the Netherlands. OK, now, uh, Ka uh, Abraham Kuyper was an anti-modernist. OK, he vigorously ridiculed modernism in theology as a newfangled fad based on superficial view of reality. He argued that modernism missed the reality of God, of prayer, of sin, and of the church. He said that modernism would eventually prove as useless as a squeezed out lemon peel, <laughs> while traditional religious truths would survive. In his lectures at Princeton in 1898, he argued that Calvinism was more than theology. It provided a comprehensive worldview and indeed had already proven to be a major positive factor in the development of the institutions and values of modern society. Now, here's the deal. This dude played a big role in helping us understand the importance of Calvinism. I seen a post on July 4th that said, if you really want to celebrate July 4th, go find a Calvinist and give him a hug, right? Because if you look at the foundation of our country, you will come to understand that most of them were Calvinists. And you will understand that these uh, uh, Reformation thoughts, these Reformation philosophies, what came from the Reformation ultimately influenced Western civilization. And this is why we live how we live today. Like, here's the deal. Whether you are a Calvinist or not, right, it is important that you understand what Calvinism did for the church. Some people would even boil down to say, like, hey, I don't have to argue about Calvinism and Arminianism because I know that Paul was a Calvinist. Or I know that Jesus was a Calvinist, right? Now, obviously, we know that they weren't quote unquote Calvinists, but what they mean is that the teachings of John Calvin, when it comes to the doctrines of grace, when it comes to soteriology, are so biblically rooted that the same thing that John Calvin ultimately thought taught was taught by the apostles and was taught by Jesus. Therefore, we know that John Calvin, we know that Augustine, we know that Luther, we know that John Knox, and we know that a lot of these early uh, reformers pulled from the scriptures, pulled from 
early church history and, and were able to break free from the chains of Rome and Catholicism and, and therefore came up with what we know today as the Reformed faith, right? So it's important that you understand that. Uh, Abraham Kuyper um, helped us understand how important Calvinism was in the development of our institutions. Now, here's the deal. We, we know that he was an anti-modernist, but what is modernism? Again, I don't just want to sit here and, and talk like I know what I'm talking about, right? I want to help you identify and know what these things are like that when you hear them um, in circles, you know, you know what they're talking about. Modernism was a movement in the arts in the first half of the 20th century that rejected traditional values and techniques and emphasized the importance of individual experience. OK, now check this out. Modernism rejected traditional values, right? Rejected those techniques and the things that helped us shape and form this beautiful, beautiful country that we have today, right? As ugly as it may seem and as ugly as people may be, um, let me tell you something. You live in the best country in the world. I promise you that. This is why everybody wants to come to America. As fallen as, is, as, as, as it is and as far as is going away from God at times, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I wouldn't want to raise my children anywhere else. And here's the deal. If things continue to go south the way they do, then I may change my mind. But ultimately, what I'm trying to tell you is that there's these, these values, this tradition, these techniques that helped us grow into what we are today. Modernism rejects that. And it overemphasized individual experience. Now, you can see that modernism eventually crept into the church. And, and we went away from the traditional values of the church and what Church history taught us and what the Bible teaches us and we're focused on individual experience where we overemphasize individual experience experiences over the word of God. And ultimately, the, the ultimate authority is no longer the word of God. It's no longer sola scriptura, but it's sola, sola me, right? Sola me, sola what I've gone through. It's, it's all about what I believe, what how I feel and the things that I, I've experienced and and. And, and if what you say the Bible says doesn't line up with my experience and the Bible is wrong and I'm right, right? We see how modernism eventually crept into the church. But Abraham Kuyper um, rejected modernism, right? He was an anti-modernist. And, and this is how it's important for us to understand this and recognize this because the further we go away from these traditional values, right? Like, like when our country was first established, um, the further we go away from God, and we'll get into that later. I want to share some of his theological views with you. Uh, most important has been Kuiper's view on the role of God in everyday life. He believed that God continuously influenced the life of believers and daily events could show his workings. Kuiper famously said, and we quoted this at the beginning, oh, no single piece of our mental world is to be Herman." hermetically sealed off from the rest and there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which christ who is sovereign over all does not cry mine end quote god continuously recreates the universe through acts of grace god's acts are necessary to ensure the continued existence of creation without his direct activity creation would self-destruct <laughs> it's important for you to recognize um, what this man believed, right? Abraham Kuyper, in order to understand sphere sovereignty. Um, because this will show you um, how it's biblically rooted. I, for a long time as a Christian, had a hard time believing, you know, some of these philosophies and some of these things that ultimately only help us categorize things better in our mind, right? Like some people say, you don't need theology. That's a contradictory, contradictory statement within itself, Right. When you say you don't need theology, what you're saying is that you don't need to study God's word, right? What they mean or what they, I believe they want to say is that you don't need someone else's um, uh, uh, ideas or views about the word of God. But if God has blessed an individual with special revelation and is able to interpret scripture according to God's will, God's purpose for our life, and has done works and work 
and work and years and years of study and diving into the scriptures to help develop a system that would allow you and people like myself to get into it and, and read it and understand the Bible better, then, then that is good, right? That is good. So when we're talking about sphere sovereignty, it is important that we understand that we must know, first of all, what it is that this man believed. Where did, where did it come from and was he coming from the scriptures? Well, when you understand how Abraham Kuyper felt about God, then you would understand how he came up with the idea of your sovereignty because he ultimately believes that there is nothing in this world, nothing, not a square inch, in which Christ doesn't declare mine. That's mine. That's mine. That's mine. Right? It's important. And, and, and also that he believed that God's acts are necessary to ensure the continued existence of creation, right? The Bible says that God not only creates, but he he upholds everything by the power of his word. So again, we see that these are biblical concepts. We consistently need God to be actively working in our life. If not, creation would self-destruct. Let's get into some of the political views of Abraham Kuyper. Kuyper's political ideals were orthodox, Protestant, and anti-revolutionary. The concept of sphere sovereignty was very important for Kuyper. He rejected the popular sovereignty of France. <clears throat> I'm sorry, of France. See how my voice squeaked there? Of France in which all rights originated with an individual, right? And the state sovereignty of Germany in which all rights derived from the state. So let, let's let's make this clear so you understand what it is that he rejected. He rejected the popular sovereignty of France, which all rights originated with an individual. So he was able to say, I don't agree with that concept, that everything comes from an individual, right? Or as he rejected the state sovereignty of Germany, that all rights were derived from the state, indicating that he didn't believe that rights and laws come from the state. Now, you may be like, well, wait a minute. How, how, how does that make sense? Well, we're going to get into that in a little bit. Just want you to understand what he rejected, right? Ultimately, um, instead, he wanted to honor the intermediate bodies in society, such as schools and universities, the press, the business, industry, the arts, etc., each to which would be sovereign in its own sphere. In the interest of level playing field, he championed the right of every faith community among whom he counted humanistic and socialists to operate their own schools, newspapers, hospitals, youth movements, etc. He sought equal government finances for all faith-based institutions. He saw an important role for the state in upholding the morality of the Dutch people. So as you can see, even within his concept of sphere sovereignty, he believed that people that weren't even Christian, right, that he would ultimately consider um, humanists or socialists, that they had the right within their own sphere, within their own jurisdiction, right, to lay out their own institutions, to govern their own schools and things of that nature, right? Same thing for university, same thing for the press, same thing for businesses, Within their own spheres, they had the right in a jurisdiction that would allow them to freely work accordingly, right? Um, without crossing boundaries and ultimately without overthrowing or overpowering or coming against the bigger sphere, which is Christ, okay? Ultimately, he, he was trying to level out the playing field and be like, hey, look, good. Let's, let's separate these things. And let's let them run within their jurisdiction, but let's keep morality at a high, right? And make sure that nobody crosses boundaries and make sure that everybody ultimately is doing what God has called them to do. Whether they believe that God called them to do it or not. Here's the deal about Christianity. And this is a conversation that I have with a friend of mine who's an atheist. Um, And I don't know if he's a friend, right? We argue a lot on Facebook. At one point in time, he proclaimed to be a believer. Um, and, uh, we actually met him out in the streets while we were doing open air preaching. Um, but I tell him this, I'll tell him, 
Um, the difference between the atheist and the Christian is that the Christian will be able to look at the atheist to be able to look at the Muslim, the Hindu, um, uh, the Jew, uh, people that don't even believe what we believe, right? And recognize the imago dei on their life. And therefore, we believe that they have rights. We believe that they uh, 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 have the right to live. They have the right to freedom. They have the right to do uh, what God has allowed them to do. Not because they're Christian, because we know they're not, but because they're made in the image of God. Whether they believe that or not, right? We must respect them, right? There's a difference when it comes to other religions, right? We see videos of uh, people who practice Judaism in Jerusalem spit on Christians, right? Uh, we see and we've seen um, uh, Muslim jihadists uh, who are willing to execute Christians live on YouTube, live on Facebook, ultimately, um, you know, because we believe differently, right? And the list goes on and on and on and on, right? But the reality is that when we look at um, what Abraham Kuyper believed, uh, he established a lot of this um, in order to help us understand the difference, right? Now, another thing uh, that Kuyper believed is that God was overall, right? Kuyper argued and demonstrated from the Bible that God has created in society a number of different institutions or spheres, each with their own respective roles and responsibilities. Now, I want to share three of these with you, but as we move forward here in a little bit, I want to share a little bit more. And I'm going to try to break this uh, episode down. If I have to stop at about an hour, I will. Um, but it is important that we understand uh, where we are, okay? Um, let me share some of these fears that Abraham Kuyper uh, believed were created by God. The first one was the church. Starting with Adam and continuing through Noah, Abraham, the people of Israel, and the New Testament church. Second was the state whose role is set out in various places, including Psalms 72 and Romans 13. Kuiper also believed that God created the sphere of the family, which began with Adam and Eve. In the Bible, God gives each of these spheres a distinct task and role. So, for example, the sphere of the state is sovereign in matters properly within its jurisdiction, as given and defined by God. Some of those matters would include criminal law, national defense, and maintaining a fair and impartial justice system. The sphere of the church, or as Kuiper would ultimately um, point out, a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, a monastery, is sovereign over areas within its jurisdiction, theology and doctrine, and church discipline and membership. So as you see, these, this is a historical view of sphere sovereignty, right? As far as where it came from, what it ultimately broke down to, what Abraham Kuyper believed, um, and, and, and how me and you should be able to look out into the world and be able to break and separate these things apart to some degree, even see where each sphere is, is, is connecting and, and maybe coming together um, in order for us to be able to make decisions. And for example, like the 2024 uh, election between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, right? Um, but before we get a little bit deeper into that, I want to show you some Bible scriptures, right? That ultimately give us an example um, of, of sphere sovereignty, right? Because sometimes I believe we, we get so caught up um, in, in some of these issues, some of these philosophies, and people um, may say, well, look, it's fine you gave us all this history, but, but where do we see this in the Bible, right? Where do we see this in the Bible? Um, we see this being acted out with the separation of the priest and the king, right? So in the Old Testament, we see the separation of priests and king, Moses and Aaron, Samuel and King Saul, right? And we're going to go through some of these examples, but I want to start off real quick with John chapter 19, chapter 10. I mean, John chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. I think this is the greatest example um, in the New Testament uh, where, where, where Jesus verbally um, said something about this in order for me and you to be able to say, hey, that's it. I, I get it. I get what Abraham Kuyper got it. I, I get uh, what Brother George is talking about in this sense. I get what Brother Ryan was talking about. 
um, in the previous episode. Uh, this will help us understand sphere sovereignty. John 19 verses 10 and 11 says like this. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? So, so here Pilate in his high horse, on his high horse, is telling Jesus, why don't you talk to me, man? It's like, I run this place. I run your people. I run the people that are trying to kill you, right? And, and ultimately, you know, and it doesn't verbatim say this in the scripture, but Pilate had the ability, whether he found guilt or not, <laughs> to say, man, the Jews are tripping. The religious leaders are tripping. I'm going to let this man go, right? Or he had the ability to be just. And, and, and say, hey, look, uh, according to the evidence that you provided, um, I see that this man is guilty. Obviously, that wasn't the case because Pilate ultimately said that he found no guilt in Jesus. Or he could say, hey, look, based off the evidence that you've given, none of that proves that this man is guilty. Therefore, I'm letting him go. Ultimately, Pilate believed that he had the authority. He had the life of Jesus in the palm of his hand. And he could either let him go or send him to the cross. But look how Jesus answered in verse 11. You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. <laughs> right? Jesus is saying, he didn't say, no, Pilate, you don't have authority. That's not what he said. He said, the only authority that you have is the authority that was given to you by my father. So here we, we see that Jesus is highlighting that Pontius Pilate had authority. He was within a sphere and he was reigning within that sphere. But ultimately, Jesus is even telling Pilate, like, whatever you decide to do, it's the guy who handed you, who handed me over to you, who has the greater sin, right? So let's look at examples of the lesser mag mag magistrate in scripture, right? So we've, we've talked about sphere sovereignty, right? Now I want to talk about the lesser magistrate because it's important for you um, to understand what the lesser magistrate is, right? Ultimately, a magistrate... Right. Um, you know what? Let's do this. The doctrine of the lesser magistrate is a Christian theory of resistance to authority that states that lower ranking civil authorities have the right to disobey higher authorities when they make laws that go against God's laws. The doctrine also states that when a ruler becomes a tyrant, they have given up their claim to legitimacy. And lesser magistrates can resist their unjust laws. This is called interposition. The doctrine is based on the idea that even the lowest elected officials have the duty to protect citizens from tyrannical rulers. For example, a state governor could ignore an order from the president that goes against the Constitution to protect the citizens from persecution. Right. This is the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. Now, the reason I bring this up next to um, sphere sovereignty is because when either sphere decides to want to take over, right, whether it's the state, government, whatever, there is a lesser magistrate, right? There is a, 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 a ranking leader that may be lower than, than the one in the state, than the one in the federal government that has a right to interpose, right? And, and I, wa I, wa I want to talk to you about interposition in order for you to understand um, how important this is when it comes to the lesser magistrate. Because if you don't, then what happens is that you get a bunch of people who just do whatever the state says, or they just do whatever their church says um, without reading into it without checking the facts and and ultimately what's happening is that they're overstepping the 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 ones in higher authority are overstepping 
And there's people that are in lesser authority that should be able to come against that higher authority if and when they're breaking God's law. I'll give you an example with the state, and then I'll give you an example with the church. An example with the state, COVID and, and the church lockdowns, right? We talked about this in the last episode, but we thought the world was ending, man. We thought that this was it. This was the Black Plague. And the government decided that, hey, it's best if, if people don't gather together, right? They shut down sporting events. They shut down school. They shut down everything, right? So it's not like they were just picking on the church, right? Um, but part of what they shut down was the church. And, and we could not gather, right, um, together as a local body, which is commanded to us by God and by Scripture, okay? Now, at first, the church was able to say, you know what? Um, the state has uh, the right here, according to its jurisdiction and according to what God, God has allowed them to do in order to protect the people from potential harm and ultimately mass death, right? That for it to say, hey, you guys need to just try not to folk, try not to, to gather together. Look, it's not just you guys. We're stopping school. We're stopping sporting events. We're stopping all of this stuff, right? And the church would be able to say, amen. Um, we should submit to that. But as the facts came out and we started realizing that COVID, as dangerous as it was, uh, wasn't doing exactly what the media was telling us to do or, or was telling us it was doing. Also, when we had the BLM riots and people were able to gather to protest and to destroy cities. Now, here's the deal. There were some people that were doing peaceful protesting, but the majority across the nation, and I was I seen it because I was here in Fort Worth, Texas, open air preaching uh, during the BLM riots, were causing harm. People were being killed. Cops were killed. Civilians were killed. And nobody was stopping them from gathering, right? Now, here's the deal. I don't want to say, well, BLM gathered, so therefore the church should gather. No, what I'm saying is that when the facts came out, people started realizing, hey, we can get together. Not everybody's going to get sick. At that point in time, the church had the right to reopen and start gathering for worship. Why? Because it's our right under God's law to be able to do this. When the government said, no, we had the right as a lesser magistrate, right, to overthrow that and tell the federal government, we're going to oppose. We're going to disobey because you're asking us to obey you rather than to obey God. And here's the deal. It doesn't necessarily start with us. It started with our governors and our officials where our governors decided to tell the federal government church is an essential, right? Just like the grocery store is an essential, so is the church, right? But let's let's keep uh, distance or whatever the case may be, right? So like here in Texas, the governor of our state um, declared that church was essential, right? In some cities, right? within texas uh some of their mayors and some of the people running the cities were like no it's not an essential and they didn't allow people to to gather and when people did gather um you know people got arrested and this happened all across the nation right different examples right the people in authority in our local cities in our churches at that point in time within the jurisdiction of the church within the sphere of the church have the right to say to the federal government, um, we're going to stay open, right? That's one example. Second example is this. Um, say you're in a church, right? And you're within the sphere of the church and you're within the sphere um, and the jurisdiction of, of the local body. And the pastor or the authority within the church is wicked and is asking you to do things that is breaking the law, that is causing harm to your children, that is causing harm to your family. Let's just use the example of a false teacher who is preaching false doctrine that's ultimately leading you and your family astray. You have the right to stand up and say no. If what that person is asking you to do is contrary to God's word, God's teaching, and, and God's protection over your life, you have the right to stand up and say no. You could leave. You can interpose, you can stand as an intermediate between the rest of the body and try to get that false teacher, you know, disqualified, remove him. Well, obviously, he's disqualified. He's a false teacher. Um, but say he's not a false teacher and he's just somebody that's whatever, 
right? And, and asking you to do things that are not right, you should be able to stand up and separate yourself from that and say, hey, by obeying you, I'm actually disobeying God, right? It's important that we understand that when it comes to sphere sovereignty and the lesser magistrate, right? Now, in order to understand the lesser magistrate, I want to talk to you about interposition. And, and I'll give you a, a, a definition here, right? Interposition is the calling of God which causes, right? I'm sorry. The doctrine of the lesser magistrate is rooted in the historical biblical doctrine of interposition. Now we know that every one of these spheres touch and we could be part of each sphere simultaneously. But the internal structure of each sphere is to be ran according to his jurisdiction. Interposition is the calling where God causes someone to stand in the gap, right? Where you stand in between, okay? Where there's somebody in a higher authority causing harm to people that are lower in the ladder, Someone is, is interposing, they're standing within the gap, right? What they're doing is they're willing, willingly placing oneself between the oppressor and its intended victim. Interposition is demonstrated when someone or some group interposes or positions themselves between the oppressor and the intended victim. This can be done verbally or physically, right? So... We're going to look at some places in scripture um, where this took place, right? Where someone stood in the gap. This is to help us understand the lesser magistrate, right? In Exodus chapter 1, verses 15, and we're going to go all the way through 22. The word of God says this. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sifra. And the other was named Pua. And he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it is, if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had spoken to them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and let the boys live? Then the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can come to them. So God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied and became very mighty. Now it happened that because the midwives feared God, he made households for them. And Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you are to cast him in the Nile and every daughter that they have, you should keep them alive. So here, we see the midwives working as the lesser magistrate. When the higher magistrate called them to destroy or kill the baby Hebrew boys, they stood in the gap. They disobeyed. They rebelled. Why? Because they feared God, right? This is a perfect example, right, of how interposition works, how the lesser magistrate works in order to give us a biblical example, right? That there's times where the government, the state, it, it, if it's not a good church, even your church would call you to do something that is actually calling you to disobey God. In return, you must disobey that higher authority. And submit yourself to God. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 14. 1 Samuel chapter 14. I think this is a, a good example. Again, um, we made it clear, right, that we see this taking place. Um, not only sphere sovereignty, but the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. We see it taking place uh, within the Bible, right? So when, when God separated priest and king, Moses and Aaron, Saul and Samuel, we see that God is separating these spheres 
throughout history and giving them their proper place and their proper jurisdiction. And one is not to cross over the other, right? Check this out. First Samuel chapter 14, verse 24 says like this. Now the men of Israel were hard pressed on that day and saw had put the people under an oath saying, curse be the man who eats food before evening and until I have avenged myself of my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Now, all of the people of the land entered the forest and there was honey on the ground. So the people entered the forest and behold, there was a flow of honey, but no man put his hand to his mouth for the people feared the sword, the sworn oath. But Jonathan had not heard when his father put the people under a sworn oath. Therefore, he put out the end of a staff that was in his hand and he dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were brightened. Then one of the people answered and said, your father strictly put the people under a sworn oath saying, cursed be the man who eats food today. And the people were weary. Then Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. See now how my eyes have been, have brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more if only the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they had found for now, the slaughter among the Philistines has not been great. Then they struck among the Philistines that day from Mishmash to Ahalon, and the people were very weary. So the people rushed greedily upon the spoil, and they took sheep and oxen and calves and slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are sinning against Yahweh by eating with blood. And he said, You have acted treacherously. Roll a great stone to me today. And Saul said, scatter yourselves among the people and say to them, each one of you, bring me his ox or his sheep and slaughter it here and eat. Do not sin against Yahweh by eating with blood. So all the people that night brought each one his ox with him and slaughtered it there. And Saul built an altar to Yahweh. It was the first altar that he built to Yahweh. Then Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and take a spoil among them until the morning light and let us leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good in your eyes. So the priest said, let us draw near to God here. And Saul asked of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him on that day. And Saul said, draw near here, all you chiefs of the people and know and see how this sin has happened today. For as Yahweh lives, who saves Israel, though it is in Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. But not one of all the people answered him. Then he said to Israel, you shall be on, on one side and I and Jonathan, my son, will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good in your eyes. Therefore, Saul said to Yahweh, the God of Israel, give a perfect lot. And Jonathan and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken out. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me, what have you done? So Jonathan told him and said, I indeed tasted a little honey with the end of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am. I must die. And Saul said, may God do to... God do this to me and more also for you shall surely die. But the people said to Saul, must Jonathan die who has brought about this great salvation in Israel? Far from it as Yahweh lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground for he has worked with God this day. So the people redeemed Jonathan and he did not die. Then Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines and the Philistines went to their own place i know that was a lot of scripture but ultimately which is good right <laughs> what we see here is saul giving an order which was crazy right and, and he made the people swear that that they weren't going to eat <laughs> jonathan didn't hear this order he ate the people were weary and because of this order they sinned and they ate food with blood right at the end when Yahweh doesn't respond to Saul, right? When he's asking what's going on and they throw lots and he finds out that it was Jonathan that did something wrong. He's like, hey, you broke the oath. I said that if anybody eats, they would die. So I'm going to kill you. But the people as the lesser magistrate 
intervene. They interposed, right? And what they did ultimately is they stood in the gap. They stood in the gap for Jonathan. They stood in the gap for someone that they believed had actually brought great victory to Israel. And Saul then pulled back his order from killing his own son, right? Perfect example of the lesser magistrate and interposition, right? God is the ultimate authority. The Bible says plainly, the most high rules over the realm of mankind. He gives his law at Sinai. The very first decree is, you shall have no other gods before me. He created us and thus knows best how we are to be governed. God is the ultimate lawgiver and ruler. God has established four realms to our government to which he delegates authority. And they are self-government, family government, church government, and civil government, right? We know that throughout scripture, right? God gives authority in these spheres. He then separates them and allow them to work within their own jurisdiction, right? And this is for the benefit of the people, right? When you look at that biblically, right? It should help you shape your worldview. As I said this earlier, you've probably seen all this in scripture. You've seen the doctrine of interposition within scripture. You may have not have known what it was called, just like I didn't know what it was called. Uh, you've seen sphere sovereignty within the scripture, though you may have not known what it was called, but you've seen it in there. When you see it within scripture and you recognize people like Abraham Kuyper that ultimately developed this philosophy to help us categorize this in our mind, then we are able to look at the world today and see these fears as well, right? This should help us in regards to understanding our role to play today, right? Today, um, today we see these spheres, right, in which God gives these authorities. Again, self-government, family government, church government, civil government, right? And each has its own role, function, and jurisdiction. If one invades the jurisdiction of the other, chaos or tyranny ensues, right? Think about that, guys. Think about that whenever you're thinking about the elections. Think about that when you're thinking about who you're going to vote for, right? Because when you think about that, you see why it's important for us to have our hand in, in certain spheres, right? Whether it's a Christian politician whether it's a Christian representative of the state, whether it's a, a, a Christian president, right? It is important for us to, to recognize these things, right? And, and you also have to be able to distinguish between the two because depending on who you vote for, if and when you do vote, some respect these boundaries while others don't. Where one party... Um, as good as it may seem, uh, would allow you to rule within the sphere that you're in, another party would ultimately overstep their boundaries, right? Now, I'm not saying that the better party, in this case, let's say uh, Donald Trump, would never overstep his boundaries, right? Um, when we're talking about Donald Trump, you're talking about a man who... Um, created Project, I think, Warp Speed, right? The mass vaccination of the world, of people, right? Now, I wasn't forced to get vaccinated, right? But a vaccine was created under his administration, and it was distributed to everybody um, in the United States. Under his administration, companies were able to say, if you don't get the vaccine, you can't work. 
or or if you're already working here and you don't get the vaccine, uh, we'll have to fire you. He allowed that, right? Um, though under his administration, um, we seen uh, uh, a big push uh, for pro life, um, and we seen him discuss how important these pro life values were to him, and also seen him declare uh, that anybody who murdered a baby in the womb should should you know see uh, be prosecuted under the law. We also see him pull back from that view, right? Uh, when we see somebody who has declared to be a uh, quote unquote Christian, he is also pro LGBTQ, right? Now, when you understand sphere sovereignty and you understand the lesser magistrate, you understand that what you know about these people matters. What you know about your rights, your God given rights matter and 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 whether trump is in office or kamala ultimately ends up in office you'll be able to distinguish when boundaries are being stepped overstep overstep you'll be able to see when someone is is just utilizing um the lesser magistrate to to execute their goals um so they don't look bad right but it is important that you you recognize this, right? Let's let's go a little bit further here, right? I wanted to keep it under an hour, but that, that's probably not going to be the case. Um, let, let's start with the first, uh, self-government, right? The authority of an individual possesses in any one of these four realms of government is delegated authority. In other words, they derive their authority from God. Their authority is not autonomous or unconditional. Their authority is God-given. Thus, they have a duty to govern in accordance with his rule, right? Um, Colossians 1.16 says, For in him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and in invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. When we talk about self-government, government, we're talking about self-governing ourselves, right? We need to be able, uh, within the sphere that we're in, uh, to rule according to God's authority given to us in our life. A father who has authority in the family government should not tell his son to steal or to murder, right? Like me. As I self-govern myself and my family, just because I'm the authority in my family, I cannot tell my son that it's okay to break the law, right? I have a responsibility before God to instruct my child in the ways of the Lord, right? And I have a responsibility to govern my family according to God's will. The civil government has the power of the government is not unlimited and does not get to create laws as they go, right? The men need to understand that the state is not God. The authority it possesses is delegated authority from God, right? So when you're looking at civil government, you must understand, we must understand that they are not God. Let me tell you something. Donald Trump and his administration are not God. <laughs> we for sure know that Kamala and her administration or Biden and her administration are not God. And the only authority that they have or that they possess is given to them by God. And, and they are not able to just create laws out of nowhere and, and just try to pass them and push them through without us not saying anything. Because if and when they start to create laws and dismiss God's law, then they're putting themselves as God, right? And you and me as a lesser magistrate must come against it. Romans 13 verse 1 says this, every person is to be in subjection to governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those which exist have been appointed by God. So the, th the authorities that exist are appointed by God. America's founders understood that the civil government's authority was delegated and therefore limited, right? And and um I'm not sure if I said this already, but there there is a book that I'm reading and we're kind of going through the first seven chapters here. Um it's called The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate. And I'm going to be quoting a lot from this book because I'm learning as I go and I want to share it with you guys, right? So 
when we're looking at Romans 13, it is not descriptive. It is, I mean, it is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. It's telling you what the government should look like and what they should be doing and how we should respond to it. When Romans 13 says that every person should be in subjection to the government authorities, it is in response to seeing that the government is doing according to God's law. America's founders understood this, right? They stated in the Declaration of Independence that all men are endowed by their creator with a certain un alienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness they understood that rights did not originate from the state but rather were given to men by god great britain had ceased to rule and function within its god ordained limits therefore america's colonists found themselves in conflict with her they the very next line of the declaration of independence states that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Hence, when a government ceases to protect the citizenry of their God-given rights, but instead constructs laws attacking and depriving men of those rights, that government has perverted its power and has decided to play the tyrant. Such a government is to be resisted and not obeyed regarding those areas of unjust laws. Right? So... In the Declaration of Independence, we see sphere sovereignty and the doctrine of the lesser magistrate echoing, right? Echoing. Our, our founding fathers in America weren't ignorant to this. But, but on the other hand, it was the foundation of what was built. Uh, if you get a chance, I want you to look up John of Salisbury, right? Um, in his monumental work, uh, Polycrates, written in 1159, he taught that the state's authority was delegated authority. He writes, all power, authority, is from the Lord God. The power which the prince has is therefore from God, for the power of God is never lost nor severed from him, but he merely exercises it through a subordinate hand. In his writing, Salisbury states plainly that the king is a king precisely because he rules in the fear of the Lord and according to his law. When the king makes a law contrary to God's law, he becomes a tyrant. What is tyranny? Salisbury wrote, for tyranny is abuse of power entrusted by God to man. All authority, including civil authority, is delegated authority. When a higher authority makes an unjust law, he abuses his power and may be resisted. When the lesser magistrate sees the higher magistrate make a bad law it is the right and the duty of the lesser magistrate to interpose against such false law right so we see john of Salisbury, even in 1159 when talking to the prince and the king he is telling him the only power that he has comes from god and if and when this person this authority the higher magistrate um does something that goes against god's law it is in, within the realm of the lesser magistrate to interpose, to stand in the gap, to come against, and, and even to be disobedient, right? Because just like the disciples said, should we obey man and disobey God? Obviously, the answer would be no. We should obey God, right? We should obey God. And sometimes, if and when things get out of hand, it would coexist with disobeying man john calvin said this for earthly princes prince says lie as, lay aside their power when they rise up against god and are, are unworthy to be reckoned among the number of mankind we ought rather to spit upon their heads and to obey them and that's strong language right but ultimately what john calvin was saying is that when someone in authority rises up against god then they are unworthy of their position right and we, we are to disobey. We are to spit upon their heads than to obey them, right? We see Martin Luther doing this with Rome and ultimately which led to the Protestant um, Reformation. You have to think about this, guys. See, our modern culture has been indoctrinated by statism, okay? 
Statism is a political system in which the state has substantial centralized control over social and economic affairs, economic affairs. People nowadays just want to shut up and just let the state rule their life, right? Um, you see this in the hood, right? You see this um, in, in, in poverty-stricken areas, right, where the government provides everything for people, but at the same time, whether it's welfare, whether it's a check, uh, whether it's insurance, whether it's vouchers for their homes, the government is in control of their lives and their livelihood. Can you imagine if the government just one day said, you know what, we're going to remove all of welfare from society? You know how many people would go hungry because those people have been depending on welfare to provide for their families. They did not work. They, they did not do what they needed to do to, to make a way out for their family, but they've been depending on the government to give them what they need, that when the government bails out, they lose everything. It's because they've been indoctrinated by statism, right? People have been, have been convinced that the laws and the rights come from the government and not from God. Again, this is why it's important for you to know this and recognize this, especially in the political climate that we're in today, right? It is the job of the lesser magistrate to remind the higher authority that their authority is delegated and limited. It is our job to declare to Trump, to Kamala, to, to any government, right, where their place is, right? Let, let, let's give you an example of the church. Within the church, when they have a confession, when they have a statement of faith, right, when, when the church declares that they're going to live by and according to a particular statement of faith, it is the job of the church to remind the people in authority, hey, this is what we proclaim to believe. This is what you say you believe. And you're veering away from it, right? In the household, it's my wife's job to remind me that I cannot choose to do something that is crazy or that will harm my family. And it is her job to try to stop me from doing something if I'm doing it that would ultimately cause harm. And if I try to stop her, I'm overstepping my boundary. I'm overstepping my sphere into her sphere of self-governance. The state is not God. The state's authority is not limitless. They do not get to do whatever, whatever seems just or good to them. Men should not give unlimited obedience to civil government. In fact, men have a duty to oppose any inauthority when they make an unjust or immoral law. The primary duty of the lesser magistrate regarding the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is threefold. First, they are to oppose and resist any laws or edicts from the higher authority that contravene the law or the word of God. Second, they are to protect the person, liberty, and property of those who reside within their jurisdiction from any unjust or immoral laws or actions by higher authority. Third, they are not to implement any laws or decrees made by the higher authority that violate the Constitution and, if necessary, to resist them. When we speak of the lesser magistrates, we are usually talking about more of a local authority. Whatever the local authority may be, its jurisdiction is smaller than the higher authority that legislate an unjust and immoral decree. Whether a governor or a state, a legislator standing in defiance of the president or Congress or the Supreme Court, or whether a mayor or a city or council is standing in defiance of the governor or Congress or state legislator, the authority of the lesser magistrate is the more local than the higher magistrate. And again, we've seen this in Texas when um, Governor Abbott declared that church was essential, right? Um, he stood up against the higher authority, uh, which was the presidency, the federal government, and said, hey, we're, we're going to open up the churches, right? Um, and this can happen in all levels, right? From the federal government, the governor standing up to the federal government, or like the mayor or the people of the city standing up to the governor of, of the state. Um, and again, guys, I, I want you to know I'm quoting the book, the, the Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate. I'll put it in the link of the description so you can go buy it if you want to. Um, I'm going to be sharing 
directly from it and then sharing some thoughts on it as we go. I want to make sure I give the plug here um, in order for you to understand what it is um, that our place is in today's political climate. Now, here's the deal, guys. Um, this book was written years ago, um, and and these ideas um, are ideas that we should have been implementing years ago. But because we we have been so indoctrinated by statism, um, you know, even Christians have given up their rights within the civil sphere, within the governing sphere, uh, governmental sphere, and handed it over to pagans. And then we whine and complain when things don't go um, the way we want, right? Uh, in other words, again, quoting for the book, um, with shekels comes shackles. The federal master has bought the lesser magistrate off so that more readily to do its bidding rather than the people's. The lesser authorities become more, become mere implementation centers of federal policy, right? So the higher magistrates buy out the lesser magistrates. Shekels for shackles, money for chains, right? And again, when we see, um, like if you look at the state of welfare um, from 19, say 30, moving forward, you're going to see groups of people that went from thriving, thriving, right? And being some of the most successful groups in America um, being destroyed because of things like this, right? Where the government pretty much pays them off and, and convince them that they were owed something and convince them to stop working and convince them to stop having a man in a home and convince them uh, that as long as you do this, uh, we'll pay your rent, we'll buy your groceries, we'll give you insurance. And, and what you've seen was a decline in male figures in the home, uh, an increase in single mothers, an increase in abortion, an, uh, uh, an increase in, in, in um, in people not working in unemployment. Right. And, and it's not hard to see where this is happening, guys. It's not hard to see like the minorities are the ones being hit by this. The, 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 the black minorities, the Mexican minorities, right. Are the ones being hit by this, right. Because we are convinced that we're owed something. And, 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 and they give us uh, uh, shekels and chains, right? Money and chains. And, and we're like, hey, look, as long as we're being taken care of, we're good. But really, we become slaves to the government, slaves to the state. And, and we put the state on the altar thinking, well, as long as the state is paying my bills, as long as the state is taking care of me, this is literally the move for the left. The left makes all these promises, and, and here's the deal. It's costing somebody. <laughs> but in order to get your vote, they make all these promises in order for you to choose them. And what we're choosing is, is to be slaves, right? Um, Salisbury uh, said this. He rightly declared in his uh, work on Polycrates, he said, Loyal, loyal soldiers should sustain the power of, of the ruler so long as it is exercised in subjection to God and follows his ordinance. But if it resists and opposes the divine commandments and wishes to make me share in its war against God, then with an unrestrained voice, I answer back that God must be preferred before any man on earth. Check this out, guys. For nearly 1,500 years throughout Western civilization, the objective standard was the law of God. This fact was acknowledged by writers in the West for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Like, you can go back to William Blackstone from 1723 to 1780, right? Saying things like this. The higher law is God's law. Blackstone referred to God's law as those superior laws. And stated that upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, God's written law, depend all human laws. That is to say, no human law should be suffered to contradict these laws. 
We can be sure that when Blackstone spoke of the superior laws, that no human law should be suffered to contradict, he was speaking of God's law as revealed in the Bible. He went on to write, it is binding over all the globe in all countries and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this, and such of them are valid derived such of them as are valid derived all their force and all their authority immediately or immediately from this original. The doctrine thus delivered the call, the revealed or divine law, and they are found only in the Holy Scriptures. Blackstone went on to say, We see people, again, like Blackstone, saying this way back then, right? That God's law was supreme overall. James Wilson, 1742, 1798, was a signer of, of the Declaration of Independence and was a major force in the drafting of the U.S. Constitution and one of the original justice appointed to the United States Supreme Court by George Washington. Like Blackstone, he said the following about the law. As pro promulgated by reason in the moral sense, it has been called natural. As, as promulgated by the Holy Scriptures, it has been called revealed law. As addressed to men, it has been de uh, denominated the law of nature. As addressed to the political societies, it has been denominated the law of nations. But it should always be remembered that this law, whether natural or revealed, made for men or for nations, flows from the same divine source. It is the law of God, right? You have men from way back when up until now, signers of the Declaration of Independence, founders of the country that we currently live in, declare that the God of law was over, right? So when we talk about this sphere, we should be able to look at the world where the major sphere, which everything flows from, is God. And, and here's the deal. I actually have another um, have another diagram here that I want to share with you guys um, to help you understand this. And again, we're almost done, guys. Um, check out this diagram right here. God, the creator of the sovereign and the sovereign ruler of the universe is within all, right? So we see that everything else is going to flow, right, from God or is maintained by God or is under God, comes from God. And if at any point in time, any of these fears start contradicting what God has called them to do, we are to step in. We are to interpose at times even to disobey, right? In 1930, a group of Christian people actually went out to an abortion clinic and, you know, interposed for, for dying unborn children. And when they did so, and they were asked, why, you're, why are you doing this? They said, we're practicing the biblical doctrine of interposition, right? We have to understand that we have a duty, right? We have a duty as a lesser magistrate um, to stand in the gap. If there is no objective standard to judge the purpose or the limits of the state, then the state can do whatever it pleases because the people will not know any different. If a citizen does not know the purpose, functions, and limitations of the state, then the state can do whatever it wants to do because the citizenry doesn't realize anything improper is being done. For there to be any indignation towards acts of tyranny by the state, one must be able to identify tyranny. The law of God is that objective standard so that men know when governments are making unjust or an immoral law. Unfortunately, many today believe there is no objective standard to which the government of men are accountable. The results are disastrous. Good becomes redefined as evil and evil becomes redefined as good. A person who might try to protect a preborn child from the death spends the night in jail while an abortionist who murdered the helpless child goes home and sips martinis next to his fireplace. Now, this disobedience 
is subjective and should only be exercised when the higher magistrate violates God's law. When Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, he was making it clear that the civil government has limitations. The state is not the be all and end all. It cannot declare just anything to be on its to be its own. They cannot make up laws as they go, nor change the immutable laws of God. The authority they have is delegated to them from God. It is not autonomously held. This is why we had so many martyrs in the early church, because these men stood up against the state. When the state told them that they couldn't do what they were doing, they said, should we obey you or should we obey God? Right. Think about this, guys. The persuasion of their thinking resulted in Christians overturning the greatest empire of the world, which was Rome. From there, Christianity, which breeds liberty, spread across the Western world, freeing nations from tyranny of the strongest and most brutal. Christianity established the rule of law in the Western civilization. The rule of law is crumbling in America and through the West today. 50 years ago, abortion was illegal and most of society through the prospect of murdering their own son and daughter in the womb was to be abhorrent. Now it is considered the right by law to do so, which much of society is indifferent towards it. Just 20 years ago, homosexual acts were illegal. Most of society considered it filthy behavior. Now it is decriminalized and paraded down the streets of America without even a whimper from the populace. Rather, many Americans now cheer homosexuals on. As the churches sit by in silence or busy rewriting 2,000 years of biblical interpretation in order to accommodate the acceptance of homosexuality, no fault, divorce, the decriminalization of adultery, the, the phalanx of laws created by the state to invade our domestic affairs, disarm the people, seize our property, and harass our persons, all point to the crumbling of the rule of law in America. Think about that, guys. Right? Like, like we really need to think about that as we move forward. I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. Um, 50 years ago, the law looked so much different. Our country looked so much different. And as we move forward um, in, in this political climate, I want to encourage you, right? I really want to encourage you. Um, first of all, do you know what's taking place in, in our political climate? Are you able to discern the times? Are you able to discern when the state is overstepping its boundaries? If by reading of the scripture, can you distinguish the separation of state and church? Can you distinguish the separation of the federal government, the civil government, self-government, right? If and when one is overstepping its boundaries, are you willing to interpose and stand in the gap, right? As you see all this play out, are you going to sit by the sidelines and say, you know what, I'm not going to vote? I would say it is your right to do so. I would also say it is your right to step in, make your voice heard, right? I said this before, and I've wrestled with the idea. I will vote for Trump in 2024, though I may disagree with his view on the LGBTQ, though I will disagree with his view on abortion, right? I believe that it is my duty as a Christian to do what I can and step in the gap to pick someone who I believe will at least hold up the traditional values to hold up within the sphere that he is running and, 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 and running within his jurisdiction and not overstep into other spheres. And if, and when he does, then we will interpose, we will disobey, we will come against, right? I will not vote for Kamala because there is nothing about that party that would even seem to uphold traditional values, Christian beliefs, a Christian society. And if anything, one thing that I do see is that they will overstep their boundaries. They will overstep into the sphere of the church, the sphere of self-governing, the, the, the local sphere. And we must be careful. One thing I would say is if you choose to sit on the sidelines, know why. Know why. Right. 
Know what you believe, why you believe, and also defend what you believe. My name is Jorge Ortiz. We are the We Were Built for this podcast, and we'll see you guys next time. Let's go.